his own voice. He had a better appreciation and understanding of his own time since he knew where he was. And even Cicero would quote Homer to say, and that you can see the quote here, um, Aye dop literon andron, franes erethontai, hoist the geron metaeisen, hama proso kaiapiso, leuse hopos akaristo, met amphoterosi genetai. It's a beautiful kind of hexameter, but it's fairly easy to remember with the rhythm. But it's always the same that, they, that the hearts of young men are frivolous. But it's when an elder man that is among them, he looks both behind him and in front of him. So that all comes out far better for both sides. And that's what the study of classics imparts even today. The ability to look behind us as well as forward to impart the wisdom of ages to the young students so that everything comes out better for them. The development of schools in the Roman Empire continued to foster the study of classics. Emperor Tiberius was a classicist for all intents and purposes. He turned Greek poetry into Latin verse, and he translated his Latin speeches into Greek, trying to imitate the style of Pericles and Alcibiades. Claudius was probably more of an ancient than he was even an emperor. Uh, Marcus Aurelius, a philosopher in his own right, spent his e evening studying the classical works of Cleanthes and Zeno. Plato and Aristotle, and his own writing, the Meditations, became a classical work in their own way. Which is much to say that the classics did not go unnoticed by the greatest leaders. The Roman poets Virgil, Horace, Catullus, Ovid, Propertius, they reveled in the classics. Virgil imitated Homer in his own epic poem, The Aeneid. Horace copied his Greek models of Sappho. Catullus loved his Theocritus. Ovid studied Euripides, and in fact even wrote his own version of the Medea. Propertius loved the Alexandrian poets and tried to stuff as many allusions to Greek poetry into his own Latin verse. In the Roman Empire, we see a second outburst of creative energies that remained largely unparalleled in Europe until the Elizabethan age in England. With the fall of the Roman Empire in the West, even in the early Middle Ages, the classics and education continued to be tightly interwined, particularly but not exclusively within the Christian church. According to the classic scholar uh, Jan Ziukowski, there is no era in European history in which the link was in fact tighter. Medieval education taught students to imitate classical models like Cicero, and Latin continued to be the language of scholarship and culture, despite the increasing difference between literary Latin and the vernacular, French or Italian. While Latin was hugely influential in this period, Greek, strangely, was barely even studied. Greek literature survived almost entirely in Latin translation. Greek authors such as Hesiod, whose names continued to be known, were totally unavailable in the Middle Ages. And there's a lovely quote by a 13th century philosopher named Roger Bacon who says, there are not even four men in all of Christendom who are acquainted with Greek, which is to say that one of Europe's lowest points in literary output, classical Greece had been forgotten and Greek was largely unknown. Along with the unavailability of Greek authors, there were other differences between the classical canon, which are considered standard today, and the works which were valued in the Middle Ages. Catullus, for instance, continues to be popular in the UK and is in fact even a standard work on any classical curriculum. He was almost entirely unknown in the medieval period. The popularity of different authors waxed and waned throughout the period. So a philosopher poet named Lucretius, very popular um, during the Carolingian period, was barely read in the 12th century, while the other Roman educator, Quintilian, had the opposite. So you have different authors coming and going, but the classics continued to be studied no matter what the authors were. And it wasn't until the Renaissance when Europe really began to remember who she was. And there was an increasing study both of ancient literature and ancient history, as well as the revival of classical styles of Latin. From the 14th century, first in Italy, and then increasingly as it spreads throughout Europe, Renaissance humanism, an intellectual movement that advocated the spirit and imitation of classical antiquity, what we would call classics, developed and again woke drifting spirits. This Renaissance humanism saw an enormous reform in school education in Europe. It introduced a wider range of Latin authors, as well as bringing back the study of Greek language and literature to Western Europe. The study of classics was therefore transformative to the quality of education of all of Europe. And in fact, classics is arguably its lifeline. This reintroduction was initiated by scholars uh, Petrarch, 
who translated the Homeric poems from Greek into Latin again so that others could read them. The classicists of the Italian Renaissance were doing exactly what Cicero had been doing 1400 years earlier, and it saved Europe. The narrow and restrictive scholastic curriculum of the monasteries, they called it scientiae, we in our terms call it the sciences, they finally gave to a broader study of the humanities, which we now call classics. This humanist educational study of the humanities, the reform spread out from Italy. It was adopted by the Jesuits, uh, as well as the Protestants in England and Germany. Classics became the most important education anyone could get, particularly in order to ensure that you could read the Bible. The late 18th uh, centuries are the period in Western European literary history which is most associated with classical tradition. Writers consciously adapted and readapted classical models. Classics hit its high watermark, and we know that in England because, in fact, the English would take William Shakespeare, uh, the best English poet, and they would rewrite Shakespeare along classical lines, and these were thought to have improved Shakespeare. It wasn't until the beginning of the, the 19th century that the study of Greek became increasingly important relative to that in Latin. In this, there were claims that the superiority of the Greek arts, while in literature, we started to leave Virgil behind and again return to Homer as the center of artistic achievement. The English poet Walter Savage Landor um, claimed to have been one of the first English schoolboys to write Greek during his time at Rugby School, which is a school not actually too far away from Harrow. Harrow School, the classics, were the only education you could get. Schoolboys were taught only Latin and Greek. There was nothing else. Classics absolutely dominated the curriculum for nearly a century and produced such fine English poets as Byron, who was in fact educated at Harrow. Works in Latin were still being published. Most people could read the language. However, the influence of the classical world and the value of a classical education declined very sharply in the UK, where the subject was beginning to be criticized for elitism. It's an accusation that remains today. No new literature was being produced in Latin, and the command of Latin declined in importance. In the, uh, early, 19th, sorry, in the early 20th century, new areas, these are kind of newfangled things, were being introduced into the curriculum, strange and different and weird things like English literature, mathematics, uh, physics, chemistry, and biology. Classics was on the wane. In the same decade, <clears throat> the first challenges to the entrance requirement for Greek at the University of Oxford and Cambridge. Uh, so in the 1920s, even if you wanted to study physics at Oxford, you needed to know Greek. That disappeared. Though the influence of classics as the dominant mode of education in Europe was now in decline, the discipline of classics, thankfully, was quickly evolving. Classical scholarship was becoming more systematic, more scientific, especially within the realm of philology, or the study of language. Its scope continued to broaden, introducing other sub-disciplines, and uh, it was during the 19th and early 20th century, again, that ancient history, classical archaeology, began to be seen as a serious part of classics and not just a separate disciplines. However, classics continued to decline. Oxford and Cambridge, after stopping the entrance required, uh, sorry, the entrance qualification for Greek, later dropped Latin in the 1950s. Even more sadly, when the national curriculum was introduced to England in 1988, it didn't even mention classics at all. The term classics itself in 2019 is now starting to disappear. While at large universities like Cambridge and Oxford, there is a department of classics, many numerous and small universities, and particularly universities in Canada and the United States, there's a conscious abandonment of the term, or a more accurate adoption of the particular material of study. Many departments are now known as the departments of Greek and Roman studies. Classicists are, are nowadays more often parceled out to other departments, like politics, history, philosophy, and linguistics. Which is to say, whereas earlier classics included these subjects, classics is now being divided up into them. Additionally, nowadays, classics has, been become, it has become heavily politicized. There are those who believe that there is no value in the study of classics, misapprehend the distinction between education and instruction, and between formation and information. Copper, sorry, Karl Popper blamed Plato for the rise of totalitarianism in the 20th century. He thought Plato's philosopher kings, with their dreams of social engineering and idealism, 
led directly to Hitler and Stalin. That was through the classicizing philosophers of Hegel and Marx. There are also some voices that are starting to grow louder and louder. The classics is merely the study of imperialism, or merely the study of colonialism, or merely the study of racism. And some of you have heard of Enoch Powell's Rivers of Blood speech, which quotes the poet Virgil. And in 2019, many of those in the United States who hold alt-right views will recall Sparta, Greek civilization over barbarism, and they will continue to trumpet Roman ideals. So let me just skip ahead. There we go. So what happened to the classics? And why should it still matter today? We classicists have been debating this very question for over a century now. From the start of its decline, and very educated men, women have been engaged in this debate over the value of classics, and the debate still rages on today. As far back as 1910, Professor Paul Shorey, a famous Chicago classicist, made a defense of the study of classicists against the leading scientist of the times, Thomas Henry Huxley, who largely exaggerated the benefits of the study of science and abused the classics as entirely loose from the study of any real object and who spends, or sorry, and the students spend their days among diacritical marks, irregular verb conjunctions, and distinctions without difference. And yet, what sane classicist would characterize the study of science as simply cutting loose from human interests and merely counting atoms? Latin and Greek are dead languages, we hear people say, and yet the crushing retort is that even if these languages remain unspoken, the literature they enshrine is crammed with more life, as perhaps no other age was or will be. And so let me get on to my defense of the classics. The aims of the studies of classics are, th are manifold. Mental training, literary appreciation, the power of expression, the relations of the ancients to us, simply the ability to read, general linguistic training, and the broader utility of languages. Most importantly, the acquaintance with Greek and Latin literature and their ideas for it is the ideas that change the world. Obviously, there is nothing incompatible with all these aims. It is a question of emphasis, the needs of the class, the abilities of the students, the training they have had, the individual tastes of the teacher. A classicist may ride their hobby to death, whether it be the Greek optative or parallel passages from Theocritus and Catullus. But the good teacher, the good classicist, will almost in the same breath translate a great poetic sentence, bring out its relations to the whole of which it is a part, make a musical rhythm felt by appropriate expression and narration. They will be able to explain a historical allusion, call attention to a dialectical form, put a question about a particular use of a verb, compare imagery with similar figures of speech in ancient and modern poetry. They will use the whole of the text for a little discourse on the difference between the classical and the modern or even the postmodern. When you witness a good classics teacher in action, you will not know whether the classicist is teaching a science or an art, a language or a literature, grammar or rhetoric, psychology, sociology, because he really is teaching the elements that are indispensable prerequisites of everything. And that is my first point. Classics very much is the foundation upon which all other humanities are built. In philosophical terms, classics is the pro subject. It should always come first, in the same way that Homer needs to be studied before all other Greek literature. Now, modern classicists are very apt to play lip service to the broader service of classics for other disciplines, particularly those which at any professional study, classics may contain utility. For example, the study of Latin and Greek is encouraged for future students of science or medicine so that they might have a more sophisticated understanding in technical terminology or jargon. Same with theology. If you're going to go into the ministry, you need to be able to study your religious texts in the original language. So the beauty of the subject gives way to its utility, which of course um, enervates the whole discipline. You start to lose interest if it's simply for something else other than pursuit for itself. There is one argument which underpins all other arguments and one which constantly recurs, and that uh, the study of classics is the art of interpretation. Many people underestimate the classics as a discipline of the intelligence. Many can read Virgil and Cantullus and appreciate its stimulus to the emotions, but scientists fail to see its subtler effects of blending and harmonizing the two. Every classical work suffuse 
thought with feeling, and in turn also to inform feeling with thought. In this, it is impossible to claim too much for classics as a discipline. Uh, it's an important art of interpreting the expressed thought of another person, and that is my main point tonight, that the classics endows its students with an intelligent sympathy to understand another human. In Cicero's own words, artes humanitatis, and this is where we get the word, the humanities. I argue that there is no other exercise available for modern educational purposes which compare in this respect with the daily graduated critical classroom translation and interpretation of classical texts. The instinctively sane judgment of intended meanings, the analytical power of rational interpretation of these, each person's natural ability being equal, these are the distinctive marks of the student of classics. From the secondary uh, Latin that I teach at Harrow, where boys will gain at least some inkling of general implicit logic and structure of language, to the university level, uh, where he's exercised in the equivocations of idiom and synonym, and the finished master who uh, can weigh all the nice considerations that determine the precise shade of meaning or tone of feeling in a speech, either in Thucydides, in a lyric ode by Aeschylus, or whether even to discover whether Socrates was half jesting or being half serious in his arguments. Young students sometimes neither have power of expression nor a well-framed idea. Asking them to write in their own mother tongue a well-formed essay on a sophisticated idea is nearly impossible, but give them a speech of Cicero to turn into English and you will get both from them. They will learn a good idea and they will work on their good expression. Now ideas, knowledge, culture, originality, eloquence, these all may exist without being a student of classics. They may exist in any era, and they may exist in any language. But that critical sense, a sense of history, and a sound feeling for the relativity of meaning, these rarely exist, if ever, without training. And this is, my, and this, and this is something that is shared by many of those who are trained in classics. In my own personal experience, it tends to be those who are disdainful of the classics who betray their own deficiencies in the subject. In many ways, the value of classics can only really be appreciated by those who have experience of it. The only other subject I can think of as similar to the classics in this way is the study of law. Although the study of law is more severe and narrow in its range of topics and does not include the union of feeling and intelligence, which makes the study of classics incomparably better as a, manner, as a method of general education. If I might speak more broadly, a classical education is not an academic superstition, nor, as some people tend to view it, as an irrational survival of the Renaissance or elite. It is a universal phenomenon of European culture. If we look over our history, and I speak here in rather sweeping terms, higher education has always largely been literary and linguistic and it has always been based on classical literature, distinguished from the ephemeral, classicus non proletarius. It was like this at Rome, and if I may so, so it was certainly as well here in India. It was also true of the Islamic Arabs. Only the ancient Greeks, who originality makes um, them the exception to this rule, focused, focused themselves entirely on Homer, their teacher of Greece. There remains another principle on which the case for classics still rests, and that is that education for those people who can afford the time for non-vocational study should not be in the narrow or an immediate sense of preparation for life, which is still a phrase commonly used at my school even in 2019. But from the point of view of the individual boy, a development of his mental faculties, and most importantly from our point of view of the society at large, the transmission of a cultural, social, and moral tradition, a tradition which is, as soon as it appears to be broadly dismantled, so will the classics appear to be less useful. The classics must therefore aim to be a broad discipline of the intellect. The study of great works of Greek and Roman literature will help attune the aesthetic and moral feelings to a certain register. And I argue that no study but that of language and liter literature can do this and it is best done through an older and more synthetic form of language, that is, in relation to the student and his culture, classic. Or if I might put that more concretely, the critical interpretation or translation of such a language as Latin or Greek or Sanskrit supplies the simplest 
and most straightforward and most effective all-round discipline of the mind, all while inculcating a sense of history and a juxtaposition of the ancient and modern ideas. For modern Europe, these conditions were fulfilled by the study of classics of Greece and of Rome, and yet still we have need today to defend against the exclusive pretensions of sciences that, uninformed by the role of the humanities, threaten to renew a cultural and spiritual aridity as Europe experienced in the late Middle Ages. But nothing I have said tonight is really new. These are debates which have been uh, occurring for over a millennium. Nevertheless, we must endeavor to continue to weigh the old arguments with more discretion, adapt them to the, condi to the conditions of our present time, and throughout to insist on a vital distinction which defines classics today. The critics of the classics often put forward the truism that Greece and Rome mean less for us today in 2019 than they did for the men of the Renaissance, which is a presumption that we, ca uh, that we could count for little or for nothing. We must argue that classical studies, even apart from the technical considerations of the languages, should continue to hold a place in schools and in higher education, which remain fairly proportionate to the significance and the impact of our culture. The difficulty which we as classicists face, and indeed I notice this all too keenly at Harrow, the classics will not hold their place in